Well, good morning. I'm Ronica Cleary, alongside the fabulous. Are we on? <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Well, we'll turn the cameras on here in a minute. There we go. There we Hi. are. Hi. We're just, you know, slow start today. Make the introductions again. Welcome. I'm Ronica Cleary. You're joining us now for Fox 5 on the Hill. Uh, this fellow over here in the third chair this morning, this is Kevin Kozar. Kevin comes to us from the R Street Institute. Thanks for coming in this morning. Thanks for having Tell me. Tell us really quickly before we get begin, what is the R Street Institute for folks? We are a startup free market think tank here in Washington, D.C. We lean to the right, mm -hmm. uh, but we're very interested in social issues and other things affecting humans' lives outside of the city. You seem to be leaning very face forward right now, though, and very square in your chair. So we're, <laughs> we're glad to see you. Thanks for coming in this morning. Um, we are going to start with the 100-day mark. We're coming up on it. President Trump uh, on the job here now for nearly 100 days. Has done a good job? Some people say he has. Some people say he has not. One of those people who say he has, counselor to the president, Kellyanne Conway. This White House isn't going to be pressured by artificial deadlines. There's just so much to say in the first 100 days it hasn't gotten covered. By the way, people act like the, that Neil Gorsuch as justice of the Supreme Court is some kind of a footnote in the first 100 days. It's the first time a sitting president has had a Supreme Court justice in the first 100 days since 1881. It should not be, the significance should not be lost. But in addition to that, all the safety and security measures, the grades the president is getting, these commander-in-chief numbers where his, his approval Ratings are ticking up, and, and people feel like he is making good on promises to be tough around the globe, to restate yeah. America's position and power around the globe. All right, so that is one side of how Kellyanne Conway is looking at it. There are a lot of things to get here. We're going to start with ISIS and terrorism. Um, when we look at what has happened over the past three months, this president, Kevin, we'll start with you, has talked very tough about this has taken some very tough actions, and especially in regards to these airstrikes in Syria. Is this making a real difference, though, in the fight on terror when we look recently you know, in Europe, there still continue to be per these persistent attacks? Well, yes. Um, the military has for years now been really pounding ISIS, and a recent study has shown that ISIS has lost more than 50 percent of the land it had conquered in the previous years, so they are on the run. And there's even been talk of ISIS trying to merge with al-Qaeda, which uh, analysts are interpreting as a sign that ISIS is feeling quite weak and vulnerable. Remember that very m memorable line from Donald Trump, we're going to bomb the the blank out of ISIS. We had the missile strike in Syria. That was just one strike, though, not to dismiss the significance of it. Is he following through on that sort of pledge to that stance and make that type of action when we're dealing with this crisis that we have? Well, Trump's in a difficult spot because in the course of the campaign, he sort of promised two things. On the one hand, he said, we don't want to spend too much time mucking around in other countries. Mm. It's not our business. On the other hand, he said he was going to bomb the terrorists uh, back to the Stone Age and get right. rid of them. How do you reconcile the two? And what do you do to handle the failed state that is Syria right now? Uh, is, there are no easy answers, and I think the problem is going to linger on. Real quick before we move on, though, one of the things about fighting terrorism is you, get, you have to work through a coalition. You can't just do this on your own. How is he at bringing people, partners, into this fight? Well, right now, this has been very much a United States-led event. Um, so far, I've not seen any evidence that he's been able to bring in additional resources. Uh, so this is still costing us a lot. We are doing it in coalition with other nations, but we're built, bearing a, a heavy burden of it. You know, we, d we should take it a look at the domestic issues as well, if we're thinking of this 100-day mark. But one of the things that I do want to, that sort of brings us to that from this talk of international action, I don't know if we would say it's a criticism, but certainly a question brought up in the pre press briefings, this idea that is, is international action making America great again? Does it fit in with the president's sort of promise to put America first? And I spoke with actually some tourists outside the White House. They were from Washington and, and sort of just got their impact and feedback on that. And they said, absolutely, because it makes us feel like it's America is great again, a great presence in the world. And it was an interesting take on this idea that doing things internationally affects the way some Americans at least feel domestically. Yeah, there was an interesting poll in the last week that rated Donald Trump on a variety of metrics, and the one that he got the highest ratings on was dealing with terrorism. And I think the Syria missile strikes and the tough talk uh, that he's you know, used relative to Russia, China, and certainly Middle East and ISIS has helped along that along that kind. 
-hmm. We should also point out, though, that bombing a place is not a long-term policy. Right. Um, it's not enough to dr just have airstrikes all the time. You need to be able to follow up with that. You know, a lot of Republicans sometimes don't like to talk about nation building, but that's one of the hard lessons we learned about what happens in a place like Afghanistan when you leave it to its own devices. There has to be follow-up here. There has to be people on the ground to put people in place that those bad elements, like ISIS, like al-Qaeda, don't sweep in there into the vacuum of power and then take over and reestablish themselves even further. You're absolutely right. We have the same situation in Libya. We took care of it, but we walked away from it, and now it's a failed state. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about health care and taxes, because um, we were told by the president that this week uh, we are going to find out about this big uh, tax cut. Now, the health care and the tax cut are kind of tied in, because, you know, we were told when the Obamacare repeal and replace fell apart that they were gonna immediately going to move on to taxes. This is what the president had to say about this this week. It's uh, evolving. You know, there was never a give up. The press sort of reported that it was like a give up. There's no give up. We started. Remember, it took Obamacare 17 months. I've really been negotiating this for two months. We'll be having a big announcement on Wednesday having to do with tax reform. The process has begun long ago, but it really formally begins on Wednesday. All right, so Wednesday is going to be the day that we hear about tax reform. Now, in the old days, when Eric Cantor was the House Majority Leader, he would say that nothing would get past him had it not been paid for. So you've got all these things that we need to pay for, Kevin, and we're talking about a tax cut here. How are these two things going to square now with what we have, the leadership in the House and the leadership in the Senate, and now we have a Republican in the White House? Can they come up with a plan that not only cuts taxes, but doesn't put us in a worse position when it comes to the debt. I think it's going to be really, really difficult to do, not least because it's going to be hard to get a single Democrat to vote for it. Why would they? Um, why would they want to see Trump be able to claim any sort of success? In the Senate, uh, it's going to take at least a majority, if not a full 60 votes, in order to get something like this through. And Democrats have enough seats that they can simply cross their arms and say no. So this is going to be an extremely difficult lift. And when you throw in the health care uh, situation, too, which Republicans have so heavily campaigned upon, Democrats are probably sitting back and laughing a little bit because they realize Republicans have promised a lot, but it's going to be so hard to achieve what they want. Okay, so one of the things we did at Old Ebbett on Thursday, we have a segment that we do at night on Thursday nights. We ask people, we get the pulse of the people, we get their thoughts on whatever the hot topic is. So in these first 100 days, our question was to grade the president, A through F. No one gave him an A, no one gave him an F. Now, what's your take, whether it's on an individual issue like health care or just your general feel and reaction to the president as a whole in these first 100 days? Well, I guess I would put him as a C, which is not necessarily a bad grade when you realize this is the first elective office he's held, and he doesn't have a very large network here in Washington, D.C., on which he can rely. Um, but on the other hand, there's been a lot of embarrassing moments, but you can't take away the victory that was getting Gorsuch on the court. That was probably the highlight. Um, if we're giving out grades, um, first of all, I've always felt that this 100-day mark is a whole cloth creation. You cannot judge anything especially a presidency in 100 days. So I'll give this presidency the same grade that I give every other presidency only 100 days into it, and that's an I. It's incomplete. Tom, you stole my answer. We are just getting started here, and this idea that we've come up, we love this in Washington. We love to do this thing. Many days till that. That many days till this. Mm. Here's the countdown. Here's the clock. Let's put it up on the screen. Let's start marking it off. It, that's not where we're going to be a year from now who's going to remember a hundred days so i think where we are if you want to look at this in anything that's useful is where we are from day 100 to where we were from day one and i think they're in a lot better position yes. when they hit day one like a presidency three months is a fraction a fraction of what they're eventually going to write in the history books for good or for bad about what donald trump is actually going to amount to years from now. Right. And if you remember recently, I don't know if you heard this, Kellyanne Conway gave the press an incomplete for their coverage. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll 
will set the standard. I mean, is that, are we copying out? We're probably copying out, but I'm, I'm going with Tom. I think the incomplete is a fair uh, first 100-day mark, and I do agree that this 100 days, I mean, whoever looks back on a presidency and says, well, they had a bad grade at the first 100 days, but the, I mean, it just, it's so arbitrary, and I think your point of a C is, is well made, though. I, yeah, it is arbitrary. I mean, let's be real. A president is only a president. A president can't just wield the pen and make law. And most of the policies that we have in place, most of the structures of government, those are all carved into law. And so the president can only do so much. It depends upon Congress. And Congress doesn't even get up and running until like mid-February. Yeah, and I would say one of the hallmarks of this period of time has been this president is starting to learn that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let's move on. Let's talk about the fact that historically it is typical that enthusiasm about the midterm elections from the party that is not in power in the White House, this time the Democrats, it appears to be growing. Let's take a look at a new poll by Public Policy Polling. It found that 63% of Democratic voters said that they are very excited to vote next year compared to only 52% of Republicans. Now, the gap grows among voters most excited to cast their ballots in House races, 57% among Democrats and 38% among Republicans. The poll comes on the heels of those special House races in those Republican, predominantly Republican districts in Kansas and Georgia. So, you know, our, the talk on this, again, people staying close to the vest, though, is, you know, you can look at special races that predict exactly what will happen. You can look at other special races that are just, you know, completely off. How important is this and what significance does this say in terms of the success or failure of Donald Trump and the influence he'll have on the It's nice election. that they're excited, right. but what are you excited about? Because if you look right now at Tom Perez, who's the newly minted DNC chief, he is going around talking to places that generally already agree with him. Mm. And the problem that this Democratic Party has not seemed to separate from itself is it still needs to understand the autopsy of what happened in November. If they're going out and they're still talking to the people who agree with them, why are you in Democratic, heavily liberal New England? Why are you going to parts of the New Jersey shore uh, in urban areas that you already have locked up with your own voters? Why aren't you out in places that you lost? Why aren't you, like, hitting the, the heartland, places outside of the East Coast, those flyover areas that we talked about so much? This Democratic Party, they may have a lot of excitement, but that excitement's going to temper if they don't address the fundamental basement up foundation issues that lost them this race in November to begin with. Well, before we dive into that, let's just take a listen to what Tom is talking about. It's a, it's a, they're calling it a unity tour between the Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders and Tom Perez. Uh, take a listen. This is them in Nevada. You know what, folks? You said heck no to that Joe Heck, and you elected the first Latina to the United States Senate. You know, when, when didn't go, and by the way, in 2018, you're not just going to say heck no, you're going to say hell no. Because, you know, the lesson of 2016 here in Nevada is very simple. The lesson was when you organize, when you stand for your values, you elect good Democrats. And that's what you did. You elected Democrats to Congress. You have the State House. You have the House of Representatives. And that's because you organized. So we wanted to come out here to learn from you and to say thank you and to say we are going to do the exact same thing again, not only here in Nevada, but across the country in 2018 and in 2017. Did I say Nova Nevada wrong? I think I did. I mean, Kevin, you listen to that. Is that a policy? You know, th uh, that was a fairly long clip. And as you sit there, you don't hear what the Democratic plan for jobs is you don't he you hear a lot of no and we get it we get that they don't like Donald Trump we get that Democrats across the board are opposed to this president and this presidency but this seems to be echoes of some of the same thing the tone deafness that we heard in the Clinton campaign mm. that is not speaking why did those voters go to Trump in the first place because they are disaffected because they're looking for jobs yeah, yeah. Despite Perez's glowing statements about what happened, um, the truth is Democrats have lost not just the presidency, 
but they've lost governorships. How do they get it back? Legislatures. What do they got to do? One after another. Well, they have to start appealing outside of their base. That's mm -hmm. the most basic sort of thing. Um, I also think they have to move beyond the sort of identity politics that they've been playing so heavily. That turns a lot of folks off because it's inherently divisive. And let's talk about that. That's turning one group against True. How do they get away from that, though? Because that has been lock, stock, and barrel so of a lot of, of stuff of we've heard. The identity of the Democratic Party really seems to be mm -hmm. rooted in this idea of de identity politics. I don't know how they separate themselves from that anymore, which many, I think, Democratic voters point to as concerning. Yeah, originally Democrats were able to build a coalition 50 years ago by drawing uh, blacks, Latinos, other minorities in by arguing under a rubric of equal personhood. Everybody is equal in the eyes of God. Everybody should be equal in the eyes of the law. Everybody should get fair treatment. They've moved beyond that to kind of um, almost tribalism or a cheerleading uh, a hypersensitivity and multiculturalism, and it's very hard to square that sort of thing with, hey, we're all in this together, because it just inherently pits people against each other. Well, speaking of being all in this together, let's take a listen to a Republican, Senator Joni Ernst. Now, she backed the president throughout his campaign, but she has made it clear that she backs his policies more than him personally. Take a listen. All right, we're going to skip that. Okay. But one of the questions that I wanted to ask you before we get into this, um, how significant is the result, the seven-point win in Kansas for Estes that people said wasn't a big enough win on the Republic, for the Republicans? I mean, that's what some people are analyzing it as. And then the fact that Ossoff came so close to breaking that 50% mark in Georgia, a, in a Democrat. Are these significant concerns that the Republicans should look at? Or are we making something out of nothing because we need something to talk about? <laughs> well, I think Kansas is, uh, is not a big deal. I mean, the Republican won. He, re he won soundly. Um, and no, he didn't score as high as Donald Trump did. But Donald Trump's a different animal. Um, Donald Trump is a protest vote. So there's no surprise there. Georgia's an interesting situation. The Georgia was previously held by Newt Gingrich. Johnny Isaacson, sure. Tom Price, these are conservative Republicans. Mm -hmm. So for Ossoff to get so many votes there, that's interesting. But Republicans did fragment themselves. And there's a tendency for the national media when they go into local districts like that to throw their elbows around and try to bring in and attach whatever big idea they can bring to the local race and the local district that they're probably not that inherently familiar with. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these big ideas and these bigger things that were attached to Georgia and to Kansas I don't know if they held up under scrutiny. I'll we'll tell you this. Democrats had their best chance the other day to take that seat. When you've got 18 Republicans on the other side, if you don't mm -hmm. take it then, it's probably a whole long haul for you if you're going to try to take that in the general election when they got to do the runoff. Republicans got more votes than the Democrats did despite being fragmented, despite fighting amongst themselves. Kevin Kosar, we appreciate you coming in this morning. Thank you much. Good seeing you. We're watching. Thank you so much. On the Hills, coming right back. Lucifer's concocting a plan. We're all going back to heaven. What about your mother? I plan on slamming the gates on her backside.